Hi, I'm Ted Hathaway. I'm the manager of Special Collections Preservation and Digitization, and uh, we're hosting uh, Dave Smith today to give his presentation on uh, the Mississippi River Gorge Park. Uh, he's been giving that some other areas uh, around town uh, over the past few months, and I'm glad we have him here to today to speak about this. Uh, I, as a side note, uh, I will also say that uh, Dave, who has uh, the uh, usual title as the uh, Parks Historian, uh, Park, Ford's, uh, Park Systems Historian, has also been uh, actively involved uh, with the uh, Park Board's uh, archives over the past several months. Uh, in addition to rescuing uh, a number of uh, park records in the old uh, clock tower archives at the City Hall, if anybody's ever been in there, you'll know what an awful mess it is. Um, so that's good. Uh, but also, he has been working with the uh, excellent uh, archivist Lydia Lucas uh, and also Lindsay Geyer over at the Park Board to bring into order the archives that they have, uh, not only for preservation or organizational purposes, but also to make them more publicly available. And they're doing this two ways. Uh, at least this is the objective. One is uh, through digitize, digitizing them through the Minnesota Digital Library, uh, in the case of uh, such as photographs, uh, many of which Dave has personally selected. Uh, but uh, also the hope is, is that uh, the physical assets will ultimately reside here at the library where they will be publicly available. Uh, the Park Board is very desirous of preserving these records. They're not terribly interested in providing uh, the wherewithal of making them publicly accessible at their offices. Uh, so hopefully we might be able to someday do that at the library. Uh, so uh, it's sort of a shameless plug for us, but also Dave has been very heavily involved uh, in that and also ad actively advocating for it. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I'll pass it on to Dave Smith. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Um, great to see everybody. By the way, I'm, I'm really excited about the possibilities Ted just mentioned of getting everything the park fort has, their historical records as well as their photographs, getting it all into this building, because the park board will never have the resources to make them available to the public. Um, and. Everything's set up here for that. It's a it would be a small addition for Ted and his his staff, and it would be anybody could access them, and it would be a wonderful thing. So we're all hoping that that works, and we're I think we're on the right road there. Um, thanks for coming out today. Um, we must not have any twins or Gophers fans in the bunch. Uh, <laughs> both, but they're both losing. <laughs> they're so. both losing. So. <laughs> We can assume that um, that might continue and their seasons might be about over. Um, by the way, uh, I'm going to talk and I've got some, I've got slides. Um, I hope you can see past me. Um, if you can't, yeah, let me know. the whole table this way, if you think that would be better. Can you see okay? That would be nice. That would be nice, yeah. I'll slide it over. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Better? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, because we have a small group, um, if you have any questions as I'm speaking, go ahead and raise your hand or, or shout it out. No need to, to wait until later. Um, and I, I lead with this picture. This picture is up here to start with because it's my favorite picture of the, of the river gorge, really. Because it, it shows so many things, the railroad bridge, um, the old, old car. This is West River Road, probably just... Um, just down the river from Franklin Avenue. And this is my favorite part right there, is the island in the river. Um, it, it shows a river that doesn't exist anymore, um, a wilder river than we know now, but it also shows how, um, how important it was to preserve the land at that time because it wouldn't be possible anymore. Yes? Do you know which island that is? Uh, I'm not sure. I believe uh, you know, Meeker Island is, was right around there. I'm not sure if that was it or not. Do you know the time frame? That's probably around 1910, is my guess. I'm going to change slides myself here. Um, what I've called my, my speech today is the jewel of Minneapolis, and the Mississippi River Gorge becomes a park. And it's the jewel of Minneapolis, and I chose that language because of this quote from Horace William Shaler Cleveland. The Mississippi River is not only the grand natural feature which gives character to your city and constitutes the main spring of prosperity, but it is the object of vital interest and center of attraction to intelligent visitors from every quarter of the globe who associate such ideas of grandeur with its name as no human creation can excite. 
It is due, therefore, to the sentiments of the civilized world, and equally in recognition of your own sense of the blessings it confers upon you, that it should be placed in a setting worthy of so priceless a jewel. Horace William Shaler Cleveland said that in uh, what he submitted to the Park Board in June 2, 1883, part of his suggestions for a system of parks and parkways for the city of Minneapolis. Who was um, Horace William Shaler Cleveland? We'll call him the professor because that's what he was known as, although he never went to college. <coughs> He was a landscape gardener who came to Minneapolis from Chicago uh, to speak in 1872 for the first time. There was a series of lectures at the People's uh, Lecture Series at the Pence Opera House on Bridge Square. That's where he appeared in 1872. Um, he actually was scheduled to speak the day that St. Anthony and Minneapolis voted to uh, merge the two cities into one. Um, his speech was delayed for a day by a snowstorm. But he gave his speech to Minneapolis, and a night later he was invited to St. Paul to give, give the same speech. And he talked about um, landscape architecture as applied to the wants of the West. And he was talking basically, of, of, and his speech, by the way, became the basis of his book by that name, Landscape Architecture as Applied to the Wants of the West, which is considered by many people the, the first treatise, the first definition of landscape architecture in the, in the, in the country. Um, but what he was talking about was the, the needs of the new cities of, in the western United States to plan parks, um, to plan how they laid out their cities. Because he had worked in New York, he had worked in Boston, he had worked in Chicago, and he had found, seen how difficult it was to plan parks um, after cities were already built up and developed. And his message to Minneapolis was to do it before um, the city was completely developed. Um, One of his other quotes from the 1872 speech, regarded as your sacred duty to preserve this gift, which the wealth of the world could not purchase, and transmit it as a heritage of beauty to your successors forever. He believed in nature and beauty as something, as, as something that conferred character, helped build up character in people, and that was the goal of, of Cleveland's, that was his religion in a sense, was to build character. And you did that in part by, by being part of nature and the beauty of the natural world. I just want to give you a sense of when he was talking here. Um, this was the, the bridge at the time on Bridge Square. That um, it was the first suspension bridge built across to Nicollet Island. This is Hennepin Avenue right here, um, crossing over to Nicollet Island. You realize how, um, how long ago it was, how little there was here at the time. Um, this is a view about that time from a hotel built on the St. Anthony side looking across across Nicollet Island, across that same bridge. And this is Hennepin Avenue and Bridge Square here. Um, that was Minneapolis in the 1860s. Um, so Cleveland appeared, it probably looked about like this at the time. Um, so for him to imagine um, what this city was going to need, a hundred years into the future um, was quite visionary, really. And I use visionary in our sense of the term, not their sense of the term. At his time, visionary was considered a little bit, um, you were seeing things, that, that type of visionary. Instead of uh, farsighted, it meant um, a little bit crazy. They, knowing that they probably didn't have drones at this time, how did they get that picture from that height? That was the Winslow House. It was a hotel that was built on the St. Anthony side. And it was that high. Yeah, it was uh, five stories. Um, it, was a, it was a very popular destination. A lot of Southerners spent their summers at the Winslow House. Uh, so most, most, of the early, um, most of the early photos of the city were taken from that roof. Wow. In this direction and in other directions. If you look at the collections of the Historical Society on their website, um, as well as the collections here from the, from the Minneapolis collection. Uh, most of this, uh, the, these kind of views were taken from that, that hotel. It's also on a hill relative to the rest of it. That's right, yeah. The Winslow House was built up the, up the bluff a little bit. 
so it looked out. This is the, the you know, east channel of the river. And this is all Nicollet Island. Nicollet Island comes into play um, in just a second. Um, the, the biggest concerns at the time in the city in terms of, in terms of the river were um, navigation, especially. Um, the, the Minneapolis really wanted navigation to get to Minneapolis, and it couldn't at the time. You know, St. Paul was the farthest up the river. Um, most freight went. People could reach the uh, Fort Snelling fairly easily, but they couldn't get to Minneapolis. A few uh, there, there were attempts to, say, to bring steamboats up to Minneapolis, and and most of the uh, the captains gave up that attempt before they got here. Um, the, the river was was it was too fast moving, too many rocks, too many boulders, too many islands. Um, it was just unnavigable for the bigger boats. Um, the Minneapolis um, leaders at the time, they wanted to get, be able to get boats up to Minneapolis. Um, and of course, they, they relied on, on the power of the, of the falls to um, drive sawmills in particular, and then later flour mills. Um, but the other thing that was interesting is in 1865, there was a proposal, the legislature actually approved the merger of St. Anthony and Minneapolis, the two sides of the river. Um, and at that time, what was going to happen with Nicollet Island was the southern half of Nicollet Island was going to become municipal buildings, and the northern half, across Hennepin Avenue, up this way, was going to become parkland. Um, and both Minneapolis, the citizens of Minneapolis and St. Anthony were supposed to, were going to vote on this uh, proposal, and if, if they both approved it, they would have merged at that time. Minneapolis voted first, and by several votes defeated the proposition. Um, so the people in St. Anthony never voted at all. Seven years later, they became uh, united anyway as one city, but the goal of making a park out of Nicollet Island was gone. It was lost. And some people claim that, that, that it was lost simply because somebody was going to make a little money in the deal. Um, the people who wanted to sell the land had put too high a price on it for some of the voters, apparently. That enthusiasm for parks that was that was begun in 1865 uh, remained. There were several people that were tried that tried to create parks different places. Um, Charles Loring promoted at one time trying to build a, um, a park right at the at Bridge Square, um, but the park board was created in 1883, and in his remarks. Horace Cleveland was then hired by the park board. It was one of their first acts as they asked um, Horace Cleveland to give them his advice on what to do with how to create a park system in the park. Uh, this is one of his most famous quotes from that, those suggestions, as the, uh, was the quote I had shown a few minutes ago. Look forward for a century to the time when the city has a population of a million and think what will be there once. They will have wealth enough to purchase all that money can buy but all their wealth cannot purchase a lost opportunity or restore natural features of grandeur and beauty, which would then possess priceless value and which you can preserve for them if you will but say the word and save them from the destruction which certainly awaits them if you fail to utter it. Much of Cleveland's uh, sermon, and he considered himself a preacher, um, was to preserve land while the city still had a chance. Um, and he went on to write that the banks of the river would be of such pic picturesque character as no art could create and no other city can possess. As for how to develop the river banks into a park, Cleveland wrote, no artist who has any appreci appreciation of natural beauty would presume to do more than touch with reverent hands the features whose charms suggest their own development. He was not one for a lot of artificial ornamentation or embellishment. He thought the, the the landscape architect's job was to bring out the natural features uh, in both terrain and, and plant life. Let's look a little more closely at what um, Cleveland recommended and his um, suggestions as well. Uh, this is a map he submitted along with his uh, recommendations for what be done with the park system. Um, you can see the red lines. The red lines are, are the outlines of the park system he proposed he recommended. I think it's interesting because the most important feature of it, and he called it um, 
his, recommend, his suggestions for parks and parkways. Um, he believed the most important thing was to tie parks together through a, sister, a system of encircling parkways. So you can see what happens. This is Lake Street. Lindale around Lake Harriet, partway around Lake Calhoun, down Hennepin, and Lindale, where he both wanted to be parkways, all the way up to, this is Farview Park now in North Minneapolis. That was called Prospect Park originally. And then across the river, and back down the up, along the eastern border of Minneapolis, back to the river. And then you notice he has parkways on both sides of the river, with the one parkway meeting his cross, cross town parkway at Lake Street. Um, the important thing uh, to notice here too is that there are, are a few individual parks. This is, was a separate park in northeast Minneapolis, which is Farview Park now. Um, Loring Park. Um, this is Riverside Park along the river. And Logan Park in north Minneapolis. Um, those were not necessarily Cleveland's suggestions. Those were had been pretty much decided upon by the park board. The first park board was really smart, actually. Um, they put a park in each of the four political wards um, to satisfy the, the requirements for each neighborhood to have a park. Um, Loring Park uh, was the park that was by far the most expensive to buy because it was the nearest to the main parts of the city. Um, but it was chosen because it had a lake in it that was already a popular um, skating ground in winter. Um, so Loring Park was purchased here. Uh, Prospect Park, or this is, this is, let's look at Logan in North Minneapolis first. Logan was, was uh, the neighborhood park in North Minneapolis. It was actually it had homes on it already which had to be um, moved. Um, but it was the only park that had been built up already. It was already in an established residential neighborhood. Um, Cleveland proposed a fountain for that park uh, because it had no other physical features of, of note. Not too many. This was an observation lookout tower built at the top of the hill in Farview Park in north, uh, northeast Minneapolis. Again, the, 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 it was initially called Prospect Park uh, because of its view, and then it was changed to Farview. Almost everybody initially called it Fairview, but it was actually Farview. But uh, Prospect Park is by the University of Minnesota now. Yeah, there's a, there's a neighborhood That's called Prospect a Park. One, obviously, yes. had no connection to this. Right. Okay, right. all right. That neighborhood probably hadn't been developed much at this time. Um, so this tower was actually built in the 1890s. Uh, it took a while to build, but is it still there? No, it's not. Um, I believe it came down in the 1950s. Um, but yeah, it was kind of an interesting, interesting structure. Um, I mentioned this because uh, this picture. I'll, it is, it's fascinating. I, I suspect no one will guess where that is. Um, but I, I, I showed the neighborhood parks at fir first because that was one of the, the, real, the demands on the parks, park board at the time. They had to create neighborhood parks. Um, that was really the first priority. Um, and, but the park board faced many challenges and, and obstacles. Um, while acquiring land for the four neighborhood parks, they began to try to acquire, to fulfill uh, or meet Cleveland's other suggestions, including land along the river. Uh, the park board surveyed and designated for acquisition the East River Bank at the University of Minnesota Down River to the, uh, to the boundary of St. Paul. And after many uh, revisions to that acquisition, and they actually purchased some land along the East River Bank, um, they realized that they couldn't afford to buy the rest of it and eventually sold the, the couple lots they had actually purchased. Um, if you remember the, the, the avenue, the, the parkway that was proposed for across the center of um, southern South Minneapolis along Lake Street, mm -hmm. um, the park board also made an attempt to acquire that, which would have linked Lake Calhoun to the river wow. and, and made the southern part of the, of the circle. 
or the square. Um, they found that the, the land along Lake Street was way too expensive. Um, they acquired all of the parkway from the river up to about Bloomington, but from Bloomington to Lake Calhoun was already too built up and just too expensive. Um, one of the problems they found there that they didn't encounter in, in other places, which I'll mention in a bit, is that the, the landowners along Lake Street, many of the small businesses and people who lived there, it was their only land and they didn't want to give it up. And or they also held out for higher prices because it was their only land, whereas that wasn't necessarily true as you got over to the lakes. Um, you had people that owned larger blocks of land and they could give up a little bit of it. Uh, that wasn't true on Lake Street. Uh, when they found out they couldn't acquire Lake Street all the way across, they shifted their focus a little bit south to 34th. Um, so they were going to try to acquire land four blocks farther south at 34th Street. And the beauty of that is that if you look at 34th Street and run it all the way to the river, what does it run into? It runs into Summit Avenue. Mm. Oh. And the idea was that St. Paul would develop Summit Avenue and Minneapolis would develop 34th and there'd be a bridge there. And you'd have a parkway from downtown St. Paul all the way to Lake Calhoun. What um, direction is this looking? This is looking west from Lexington and Summit. Oh, Lexington. In St. Paul. That's Summit? That's Summit? This is Summit Avenue, which, by the way, was designed by Horace Cleveland. Oh, my gosh. Horace Cleveland was also the landscape architect for St. Paul uh, by the time this was laid out. So this is Summit Ave or Lexington here looking west on Summit, which runs all the way to the river. So that map you showed with all those parkways, his plan was to have them all wide like Summit Avenue? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah. They would have all been designed as parkways, um, much as you think of Minnehaha Parkway now, um, when you get close to Minnehaha Falls. Um, the River Rose Summit, um, Summit was designed one of Cleveland's ideas in, in designing these parkways was not simply to provide green space either. Um, he also had the notion, and he wrote about this in his book, that you provided avenues for fresh air through the buildings of the city. Uh, you have to remember air pollution at the time, everybody burned coal. And it was probably a fairly smelly place. There wasn't sewage. Uh, there weren't sewer lines. Um, so Cleveland saw these as avenues of fresh air to, to refresh the air in the city. He also saw them as windbreaks. Cleveland lost everything he owned in 1871 in the Chicago fire. And one of his reasons for designing these wide boulevards was as fire breaks in the city. Um, the fire wouldn't be able to leave these boulevards. Um, another reason for them. Do they so, also have a sense of, of not just fresh air, but the grass? Yeah, greenery. Um, they, and they would have all been landscaped. They would have been planted with trees, shrubs, flowers. In a sense of photosynthesis and all that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if, if photosynthesis entered in. Um, it was more visual beauty, I think, um, than the notion that plants clean the air themselves. Um, I'm not sure when that idea developed. I suspect it was after this time. Um, but that would be an interesting thing to look into. By the way, when Cleveland was, um, was looking at designing the parkway in St. Paul and going out to the river, he made a, a comment in 1885 to the St. Paul City Council. He said, if you fail to secure that apparently worthless precipice, meaning the land along the, along the river, it will be but few years before it is stripped of its forest, which can never be restored, and its sides will be hideously marred. So he was preaching the same message and the same sermon in both cities. Um, but the park board failed on the East River Bank. Um, they failed in their Crosstown Boulevard um, simply because they didn't have money. Uh, but perhaps the biggest obstacle was this man's success. <clears throat> this is Charles Loring, where Loring Park was named. He was the first president of the Minneapolis Park Board and was widely referred to even in his life as the father of Minneapolis Parks. Um, probably did more than anyone, any other single person to develop the Minneapolis park system. Um, but among the other challenges that they faced, um, was that one of the oldest things that they had, one of the oldest 
goals of people in Minneapolis in terms of parks was to acquire a park around one of the lakes. The lakes were still the destination that was um, one of the most attractive in the city. Here's a, a newspaper quote, pleasure driving road around Lake Calhoun. The board considers that the attractions of the environs of the city would be greatly enhanced by the opening and laying out of a spacious drive around this beautiful sheet of water. And the report of its committee to this effect has been adopted. The matter is still in the hands of the board. The right of way is ready to be deeded around the lake free with the exception of one man who stands out in the hopes of realizing a little money. The project will be sent before the county authorities in spring, and in the meantime, our speculative friend may be brought to realize that what he expects to make will not be realized as a bonus, but in the increased value of his land by the opening of the proposed Pleasure Road. Um, any guesses as to when that was written? 1870. 13 years before the park board was created. So the, the notion, and by the way, the board that was referred to here is the board of trade, not the park board. Um, the park board didn't exist yet. But the, the, the notion of building a park around the lakes was old. It had been around forever. Um, and that was one of the other objectives. Remember, uh, Cleveland's map had a parkway all around, around Lake Harriet. By that time, the, the idea was to put the parkway around Lake Harriet instead of Lake Calhoun. Who was the unnamed greedy man? Pardon? <laughs> Who was the unnamed greedy man? I, I haven't figured that one out. He was, he was to my knowledge, never named. <laughs> but so the park board wanted to acquire Lake Harriet, and some of you might recognize this was taken from the roof of the pavilion at Lake Harriet some years later. Um, it became one of the most popular parts of uh, uh, the park system. <laughs> But at the time the park board was created, and they, they had Lake Harriet appraised with the idea of perhaps acquiring the land. It was appraised at about $300,000, which was not only more money than, than they could raise by taxes, it was more money than the park board could legally borrow. Um, they had no chance to acquire Lake Harriet. Um, but by acquiring the lake, do you mean the physical land I, area? Because there was I'm, no DNR who owned the water. Right. So. It was the, the, the lake shore, essentially. The lake shore. Yeah. They wanted the lake shore um, until three men came forward. Um, Henry Beard, James Merritt, and Charles Reed um, went to Charles Loring and said, we'll give you 125 feet um, wide path uh, off the lake, or all the way around the lake. Uh, well, there were a couple short sections that they didn't own, but they owned most of it. Um, and of course, Loring agreed. Um, he took the land. It took, a, it took some years to, to work out the deal. Um, but all of a sudden, the park board owned almost the, the, the entire circumference of the lake. They owned the lake shore. And it was fascinating because in the deeds that the, these men gave to the park board, they specified 125 feet wide, a, a band 125 feet from the water. But they said it didn't have to be uniform. It had to average 125 feet. They could have more or less depending on how they wanted to design their parkway. And so if you look at early, early photos of the park, and I don't have them with me, but the, the parkway was right on the shore. There was nothing between the parkway and the water. It, it encircled the lake at water's edge. Um, so what happened was is that the, um, Charles Loring acquired, uh, free of charge, um, a lake. And it became the most popular uh, place in the city, really. These, this is the rooftop. Uh, concert um, space, the, the rooftop where they had concerts on the top of the pavilion. Um, and Loring wrote in 1885 when it became clear that they were going to acquire uh, the land around the lake. He said, long after my name has been forgotten, the generations to come will see that this beautiful lake with its wooded banks was preserved for their use. But if donations could be secured at Harriet, what might Loring achieve other places? And I think that became his goal. Um, he next turned to Lake of the Isles. And you can see Lake of the Isles was still a little bit wild. <laughs> That's a great hat, isn't it? Um, Loring had a vision of, a, of an encircling parkway as well. And when he looked at 
at the, the route from Loring Park out to Lake Harriet. Loring thought that that parkway should go around Lake of the Isles and Lake Calhoun to Harriet instead of going on Hennepin, which everyone worried would become too heavy with traffic to actually be a parkway. Um, it was already built up. The, the park board did acquire Hennepin Avenue from, from Loring Park out to, um, out to Lake Street. Um, but they were able to just acquire an extra 11 feet on each side from what it normally was. But just, so Charles Loring went to work on Lake of the Isles. That's where he really focused a lot of his attention. And he eventually got almost all of the lakeshore of Lake of the Isles donated as well. Um, he said at one time, he commented to one of the lake, that one of the lake owners, John Green, he said I probably, he probably met John Green a hundred times um, to negotiate donation of his lakeshore. He said he had gone to John Green's house and they had spread out plat maps on the floor, um, looking at where he wanted his parkway to go and, and how he could accomplish that. And finally one time he thought he had an agreement. He was at the lakeshore with John Green and they were arguing over where he could put, his, put the stakes to indicate where the property line would go. And um, John Green's wife came out and pulled him aside and had a chat with him and he walked back to Charles Loring and said, put the stakes wherever you want. My wife's more liberal than I am. <laughs> so Loring said he put the stakes where he wanted and he came back uh, a week later and, and John Green had moved the stakes another 10 feet onto his own property, <laughs> giving him even, even more land. Um, but that was Charles Loring's success. Um, they, they ended up also buying the east side of uh, Lake Calhoun. Uh, they paid thirty thousand dollars for the the east shore of Lake Calhoun, so they would have a boulevard that would, could connect Lake of the Isles and Lake Harriet. Was was Loring a business person also with this, or was was this his avocation? He was not a wealthy man, but he put all this together. Uh, Loring was a very wealthy man. Um, he had made his money as a dry goods merchant. Uh, he had a dry goods store on Bird, on Bridge Square, and then he went into milling. Um, and he owned several mills, um, including the mill that was built on Lake, Her on L Lake Minnetonka at the head of Minnehaha Creek. Um, that was his, his mill. Um, he actually, he was a horticulturalist as well and grew a lot of, a lot of trees. In fact, he planted the elm trees that lined Minne Minnetonka Boulevard from Minneapolis to, to Minnetonka. But after, after Loring um, acquired this land, um, we still have to put the, the park board's work in context. Um, at that time, there was no such thing as active recreation. Um, it was all passive. There, there were no parks or playgrounds like this. This didn't come along until after 1907. Uh, here's another one. That, that previous one was Logan Park. This is North Commons. Um, you can see the playground equipment was a little different. <laughs> and uh, by the way, Charles Loring was one of the one of the um, one of the creators of the committee in Minneapolis that was working towards the development of playgrounds because playground the playground committee was completely separate from the park board. Um, mm -hmm. Those were considered two different activities, um, two different interests. Uh, Loring, Loring wrote uh, about that time, he said, a city without playgrounds keeps its children growing in straitjackets. Some become physically and morally deformed. All are deprived of a fair chance. Um, it was his justification um, for working for playgrounds. Um, the other thing that was a distraction for the park board was, uh, grew out of Loring's uh, work with the lakes. This is Minnehaha Creek near Lindale. Um, you can see there's nothing out there. <laughs> um, but like along around the lakes, uh, a few people came, came to the park board and volunteered um, to donate land. Uh, the Fogg and Butler families donated the land nearest Lake Harriet, um, almost over to Lindale. And once again, you know, the, the park boards and Charles Loring, they were opportunists. They always went where they could get, get things cheap or free. Um, and that's, that's still, that still, that persists in the park board today, you know. The, the, the park board has always take, taken cheap land or free land. It's why if, if you pay attention to where the, the playgrounds are placed around the city, they're almost all on low land um, because it was land that nobody wanted and so the park board could get it free or cheap. Um, 
Bryant Square at one time on 31st and Bryant in South Minneapolis, they said the, the grade of the, of the park itself was 20 feet below street grade. Um, and the neighborhood you know, pleaded to have the, the park bought by the park board, which they eventually did. And the, neighbor, the neighbors uh, promised that they would fill it. And they threw their garbage there for, de for a decade and it made no dent in it. And finally the park board <laughs> paid five or $6,000 to actually haul in fill and fill the, fill the park uh, enough that it could be used. Um, but I, I think that's the most important thing too. And we're talking about the, the, the river, river gorge and how that came about. Um, we're not talking about above the falls, but the same thing applies to above the falls. The park board always did what it could do cheap or free. Um, they could they could acquire many ha um, Creek because it was mostly donated, and as you can tell, there was nothing out there. It was farmland, um, and also you notice it was prairie, uh, no trees, very few. Um, and people sometimes comp try to compare many ha Creek to Bassett's Creek, which was the Bassett's Creek was an environmental disaster in the 1860s. Um, there was nothing the city or park board could have done to to save Bassett's Creek at that time. Whereas Minnehaha Park, Minnehaha Creek was still two miles outside the city limit at that time. Um, quite a different situation. Yes? On, on the topic of trees, you had that quote from Cleveland about losing the trees along the river. I understood that there weren't that many trees along the river when settlers came. Is that right or not? No, I, my understanding is that the, the, the banks there were heavily wooded. Um, the river banks were between the river banks and the lakes, there were no trees. Uh, all of South Minneapolis was prairie. Um, those trees were all planted by the park board. You know, the park board owns all those street trees. Um, so they were planted. But uh, the, the riverbank itself was heavily wooded. At, uh, what's one of the things Cleveland refers to in some of his descriptions was the variety of trees that, that grew on the riverbanks. Um, so at bodies of water, there were trees. and but not, not much in between. The other challenge at the time for the park board was Minnehaha Falls. Two years after the park board was created, the legislature passed legislation to acquire Minnehaha Falls as a state park. And they appointed a five person commission to, uh, to pick the land for that park. And Charles Loring was appointed by the governor as the head of that commission. Uh, they chose their land um, and had it appraised. The landowners all objected to the appraisals. So by that time, the 80, 1887 the session of the legislature had passed. And because it was biennial legislature at the time, um, every two years. So in 1885, they passed the law and appointed a commission. It wasn't done in 87. They came back in 1889. and. Um, the courts by then had approved the appraisals and the, the takeover of the land, but the state legislature didn't have the money to pay. <laughs> they didn't have the 92000 to acquire the uh, 120 acres of park plus the 50 acres of the soldier's home. Now, so, is so, that so, basically like what we have now with eminent domain and that they would say, here's the price? Yes. Someone would make a determination if you didn't like it. Court appointed appraisers. Um, and they determined a fair price. It was challenged in court, and the court approved the, the yeah. appointed their own appraisers, and um, then the prices were approved. Um, the state legislature didn't have the money, so several Minneapolis uh, citizens, including George Brackett, who had been on the, the park board, um, walked around and collected. He collected $100,000 from other people he knew, um, you know, promissory notes, signed it himself, and took it to the. Uh, Charles Loring's business partner, Henry Brown, said he had $50,000 in the bank himself, which he, could, he would turn over to him and borrow $50,000 more um, on everyone's signatures. And they gave the uh, mayor a check for $100,000, who gave it to the governor, who gave it to the legislature, and they bought Minnehaha apart. Wow. The men were eventually paid back as they knew they would be, <coughs> um, but still they fronted the money when they had to, um, which I, I think is a good thing. Um, but because of it, it was known for a long time as Minnehaha State Park, that was its legal name, uh, which made it the second official state park in the country. Um, the first one was Adir the Adirondacks in New York City, and extending up towards Niagara Falls. 
Um, so these things were all, all going on at pretty much the same time. Um, back to the river. <laughs> Cleveland wrote to Frederick Law Olmsted in the summer of 1889, I have been trying hard all winter to save the riverbanks and have had some of the best men for backers, but Satan has beaten us. Still couldn't get the river, and it was still what Cleveland wanted more than anything else. He still believed it was the most important part of any Minneapolis park system. Uh, by the way, Cleveland had moved from, many, from Chicago to Minneapolis in 1886, three years after the park board was created. And he moved here because he thought there, would be a lot, there was going to be a lot of work for him laying out individual parks, uh, which was true. Um, but he, he also, around this time, um, in a speech at the state legislature, said, if I can feel that I have been in any degree instrumental in securing for the future city, which my mind's eye I see so plainly spread over these hills and valleys, the inestimable, <laughs> excuse me, the inestimable boom which this possession will then be, I should deem it the crowning effort of my life, and that having achieved it, I had not lived in vain. Uh, that's how important the river was to Cleveland. Um, in 1888, this spring, he gave another important speech to the Fine Arts Society, which was most of the city's uh, wealthy um, couples. Um, and it was on the aesthetic development of the United Cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis. And again, he urged the acquisition of Minnehaha Falls and the riverbanks. By the way, in his original suggestions for the park system for the city, he, um, he didn't include Minnehaha Falls. Why? Because it was two miles outside the city limits. Um, the legislature, when the legislature created the Minneapolis Park Board in 1883, at the same time, they extended city limits out around Lake Harriet, um, specifically for the purpose of the city acquiring that land. Um, but at that time, Minnehaha Falls was still well outside city limits, so Cleveland said at one time he considered it exceedingly desirable to acquire Minnehaha Falls as, as a park, but he didn't address it specifically because it was outside of his um, charge. At about the same time in 1880, oh yes? Well, when and why did the park board have the authority to buy land outside the city limits? Um, that occurred in 1885. They went to the legislature for and got permission to, to buy land that was an extension of parkland in the city. And they did that for two reasons. One, they were looking at acquiring uh, land in Golden Valley for a parkway um, along what became in Theodore Worth Park. Um, they thought the most beautiful, they wanted to build a parkway into North Minneapolis and they thought that was the most beautiful tract of land, uh, but it, it did cross into Golden Valley. So they acquired that permission from the legislature, but it also applied to Minnehaha, because um, that was the same year they, that, many, that they approved Minnehaha as, as a state park. So it was for those two reasons the legislature gave them that permission. And they were the only city agency that, that could acquire land outside city limits, which came into play uh, uh, 80 years later, or well, 40 years later. Um, when the Minneapolis wanted to have a municipal airport, um, there was only one agency in the city that could own land outside the city, so the park board owned the airport um, from the late 1920s into the mid-1940s. The park board built the airport and ran it um, until the Metropolitan Airports Commission was established in 1943. Um, but that was, that was based on the same legislation. Um, This is another project Cleveland was working on at the time, which is especially interesting. I'm, I'm actually going to publish something on this next week in my blog. Um, so nobody but a few of us know what this picture is. Um, Cleveland was working with the famous sculptor, Daniel Chester French, who was most famous for doing Abraham Lincoln and the Lincoln Memorial and the Minuteman at, um, in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, Daniel Chester French's older brother had been Cleveland's partner at one time in his landscape architecture um, company out of Chicago. His old, it, Cleveland's partner, William Merchant Richardson French, then became the, the founding director of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, but when he was still Cleveland's uh, partner, he, uh, Cleveland met Daniel French 
um, younger brother, and he got Daniel French to come out here in 1889. Um, he got Samuel Gale, a wealthy Minneapolitan, to pay French's expenses to come out. And the two of them concocted this memorial to Longfellow. And you know, can you tell by the by where it is where they were going to put it? Minnehaha Creek in the sandstone. They were going to cut that into the limestone next to Minnehaha Falls. This, of course, is Longfellow, and these are the characters from Song of Iowa. It would have been spectacular, particularly for a landscape architect that always argued against any embellishment or ornamentation <laughs> in his parks. <laughs> but, but Cleveland had a very close personal attachment to Longfellow, because Longfellow had been one of the closest friends of, of Cleveland's older brother. And Cleveland's older brother died of tuberculosis when, in the 1840s, when the uh, Cleveland was still a young man. His brother had been like a father to him because his father was a sea captain and always away. And his brother had been one of Longfellow's closest friends. So Cleveland knew Longfellow well and looked up to him. So I'm sure Cleveland's notions of, um, of lack of embellishment in parks and natural treatment of parks was overshadowed somewhat by his affection and respect for the man itself. Plus he got to work with Daniel Chester French who was already becoming one of the premier um, sculptors in the United States. So where I, is that? Oh, th this was never developed. I actually I found the picture because I was looking through um, Daniel Chester French's um, papers he left behind, which are now at Williams College in Massachusetts. Um, and they had listed a, a photograph of a model of a sculptor French had done for an unrealized project in 1891. And so I, I, I sent them, I, I communicated with them and said, could you send me a picture of that? And this is the picture I got. And it's uh, undoubtedly um, the picture that Cleveland actually held in his hands and wrote that it would be the joy of his life, um, the rest of his life, to create a site for this sculpture. Never happened. Was this planned to be under the falls or over on the, like, on the I, west side? I don't side? know the exact location. That's one thing I have not been able to find. Um, is that, is that I would life, life size or bigger? Was that planned? Do I don't know. know. Oh. I don't know. The interesting thing is that in 1914, Daniel Chester French was hired to create a memorial to Longfellow across the street from Longfellow's house in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And he used the exact same design, except it's only a bust of Longfellow, and the characters behind him are from six of his stories, not just one. Huh? <laughs> so French eventually used this design, just in a different place. I'm talking to Faster. Um, I want to talk about the. This is Charles Loring when he was uh, in his 80s, and this, the man next to him was the other most important man in American uh, Minneapolis Park history, William Watts Falwell. Uh, Falwell was the first president of the University of Minnesota in 1869. Um, And an awful lot of what we know about Cleveland comes from um, Falwell's papers at the Minnesota Historical Society. He has box after box after box of letters that he saved every scrap of paper that ever crossed his desk, I believe. But there's over 100 letters from Horace Cleveland to William Falwell in, in, in those papers, which is how we know what we know about Cleveland. Um, Falwell, was, after Falwell resigned as president of the University of Minnesota, he, he was elected a park commissioner in 1888. And in his, in his second year as a park commissioner, uh, Falwell proposed that the park board revisit its goals and objectives and, and kind of re, re relocate itself, um, decide what they were actually going to do, um, develop a vision for the future of the park system. He said that the park board had lost its sense of vision after only eight years. And the board appointed Falwell to lead a three-person committee to kind of develop a, a recommendations for the park board. And, and uh, Falwell did that. And as he was preparing his report, he received a letter from Horace Cleveland. Um, and they lived in the same town, but they were across town. And there were no telephones, so they sent letters to each other. Um, and Cleveland, as always, his focus was on the riverbanks. He knew Falwell was doing this report. And he encouraged Falwell to go down to the East River Bank with him below the University of Minnesota. And he showed his frustration that the river bank still hadn't been acquired by the park board. Cleveland wrote to him, if all your committee would go, it would do their souls good if they've got any. When you once take in the possibilities that are open, it will drive you frantic to think of losing them. Uh, Falwell, when he finally made his report, 
Uh, he, Cleveland also wrote to Falwell, I will devote a day or any part of a day to the exploration of as much as you like, and it will inspire you to make a report that will drown the sound of an 18-pounder. His reference to an 18-pounder was that Falwell had been an officer in the Union Army, and he had headed an engineering corps, and uh, it was obviously a, an important part of his life that Cleveland would refer to it in the in 1890 still as a way to motivate Falwell. He referred, this was Falwell on his wedding day. Um, Falwell once wrote that um, he once had complained to the Minnesota Historical Society that when they published books and photos of, um, of their authors, they always published pictures of, of the authors as old men. He said they should, they should publish pictures showing them in their heyday when they, when they were vibrant and alive. So that's why I show you Falwell when he was young. Who are the children? I don't know. I believe they were the children of one of the Shute brothers. Uh, Richard Shute is named, you know, that's the, there's a Shute Square across the river in St. Anthony. Uh, that's what I, I believe they were, but I don't know if they were, how they were related. Uh, by the way, when, in Falwell's report, he recommended that a name for the, this the, the encircling parkways that Cleveland had originally envisaged. And he said that he, he justly and gladly gave, the, they gave credit to Cleveland for the idea. But he tried to resurrect the notion of, of an encircling parkway. And because of his military background, he suggested maybe we could call it the Grand Rounds. Mm -hmm. So Falwell came up with that name, and it stuck. Which I, and as is always true, I think if you put a good name to something, people are going to remember it. And, and, and it gets done. And I think one of the reasons that the uh, that encircling parkway was eventually done probably was because Falwell gave it a good name. Um, Cleveland never did. <laughs> but now the borders of Minneapolis and St. Paul right now are basically Franklin Avenue. You go south of that and east, and you're in St. Paul, correct? Yeah, it's a little a little south of Franklin. Yeah, a little south of Franklin by the railroad bridge. So when they want to extend 34th onto Summit. That's at right. one point. That's, that's the same city line it's always been, right there. Right, but, but 34th, when he wanted to run that parkway across, which is south, he would have been running into Summit Avenue, which was in St. Paul, correct? Yeah, that's right here. So did they do any correlation or a connection between St. Paul and Minneapolis saying, wait a minute, it will be much better in getting our banks of our river if we will work together, or was he just Minneapolis only saying, hey, secure your banks, and if we can get that, we'll eventually go to St. Paul, to the other side of the river. Yeah, they, 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 were, they were working at the same time, and they, they communicated with each other, and he was being paid at the time by both cities. Okay. Um, he was paid part-time, he was actually on a part-time salary for St. Paul, whereas Minneapolis was still paying him mostly just project work. All right. Um, but St. Paul actually had him on a salary. When, one of the things I, I forgot to mention was when Cleveland um, came here in 1872, St. Paul was so excited about what he had to tell them that um, they got permission from the legislature immediately to spend like $100,000 and they bought Como Park. They bought Como Park at that time. It took many years for the whole thing to play out, but that was the impetus that originally established a park at Como. Uh, so they did work together. Uh, the leaders of the two park systems communicated. Um, when Minneapolis eventually bought the east bank of, of, of the river in the 1890s, um, they, at that time they encouraged St. Paul to turn Summit Avenue down and meet their boulevard at the boundary. <laughs> so they were working together. Um, after, Cle after Falwell's paper and a suggestion of the Grand Rounds, the Park Board did act. Um, in 1891, they expressed their intent to buy, once again, to buy both sides of the river. Um, and they appointed a committee to begin immediately investigating acquiring the East River Bank. And by July 1892, the board approved the acquisition again of that East River Bank from the St. Paul border back to the University of Minnesota. Um, at the same time, Charles Loring retired from his first eight year stint on the park board as leader of the park board. Um, and at that time, he published a letter kind of recommending what the park board do from there. And one of the things he recommended was that the park board acquire the riverbanks, and which caused prompted Cleveland to immediately shoot off a letter to Falwell saying, "I told you so," <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> saying this should have been done before. 
by the end of 1892, the park board had acquired the East River Bank, um, and they had uh, paid for it. The original appraisal was $70,000, but the court raised it to $115,000. Um, and even with the increased cost, the park board uh, confirmed those awards in March of 1893. Um, and at that time, the park board was, was uh, noted that it was trying to negotiate the purchase of Meeker Island as well. Um, and it believed it should be included with the East Bank purchase, but there was n there was no further records in no further reference to Meeker Island in the Park Board records, although they did eventually acquire it. Um, the cost was assessed to property owners. Um, the cost of purchasing that land was assessed to property owners on the east side of the riverbank, which uh, they objected to um, for a couple reasons, and then it was lowered. Um, they spread the the assessments over the whole city. Um, the property owners claimed, for one, the University of Minnesota was never assessed, couldn't be assessed as a public institution. And so that eliminated the, um, you know, that group of taxpayers. And the other complaint they made was that there's only taxpayers on one side of the park. And therefore, on most parks, the taxpayers were all the way around the park. Um, so the park board accepted that argument and reduced and, and spread the assessments around the city. Um, they said it was uh, the acquire acquisition was to the benefit of the entire city in any, anyway. Um, again, one of the arguments here in acquiring that river that, that succeeded, that was convincing to a lot of people, is that the river would serve as the lungs of the city. It would be a, a channel for fresh air to the city. At, Loring had an interesting quote on that. He said, when a person is ill and goes to the doc, the doctor says, go to the country where you can get fresh air. But alas, all cannot go to the country. And it is the duty of those who control the laying out of cities to furnish the means for supplying the God that God-given element to the poorest of people. He said, by acquiring the lakes, creeks, and the great river, um, we are supplying the pure blood to our children, which will make them physically and morally strong. The park board began to, to, to develop the riverbank and in 1894 built the first parkway. Um, and that was one of the last things done for a long time by the park board because there was a panic, a financial depression in 1893 that um, destroyed property values in the city. And um, the park board pretty much had no money. Um, their assessments, their, their, what they raised through property taxes was way down and they couldn't raise any more. Um, so it, pretty much nothing was acquired for the next six, eight years. Um, until finally, in, um, in 1901, Falwell by then was president of the park board. And he said, for a period of seven or more lean years, the, park, the board has been forced to talk poor and sing small to such a degree that we hardly know how to change the manner of discourse appropriate to good times. These are good times. This was 1901. And after years of pinching pennies to pay off debt, the park board finally was able to consider acquiring new park land. And its first acquisition was the west bank of the Mississippi River, from Franklin Avenue to Minnehaha Park. And the price tag for that per purchase was less than $43,000. That indicates how badly the 1893 depression had wiped out real estate. Um, the west bank land was, uh, that was acquired was a mile longer and 100 acres larger than the East Bank purchase that had cost nearly three times as much um, eight years earlier. Um, some people attributed the, that low price to the skills of the park board secretary, James Arthur Ridgway. Um, Ridgway also negotiated a lot of the donations to the park board along Minnehaha Creek. Uh, he was the park board secretary for 25 years. Um, in fact, at the time Minnehaha Creek was, the acquisition was final, Loring said somebody should name something after Ridgeway. And after that, Ridgeway acquired the whole West River Bank for $43,000. Um, and eventually, the park board did name something for Ridgeway. Do you know what it was? There is a Ridgeway Parkway in Northeast Minneapolis, but that wasn't it. The park board named West River Road Ridgeway Parkway. And it lasted 27 days. <laughs> the, the people who lived along the river objected sh to changing their address. <laughs> they, they wanted it to be West River Road, which it was at the time. And so the park board changed it back. They said, we'll find something else to name after Ridgeway. <laughs> and eventually a Ridgeway Parkway in the, was named for, uh, for him in northeast Minneapolis. Um, 
the park board uh, took over Riverside Parkway, which Riverside Parkway now we know runs nowhere near the river. It doesn't get there, but it used to. Um, if you extend Ridge, uh, go out Riverside Parkway now, it eventually gets to the river and it follows the river. And the park board took over that section of the of the road and converted it into, into a parkway in 1904. Where is um, that now, David? Uh, the West Riverside River Parkway. Uh, West River Parkway. Was, oh, West. Was, yeah. That whole side of the river from Franklin to Minnehaha. Oh, okay. okay. That was built in 1904. And when Theodore Worth first arrived here as, a, as park superintendent in 1906, his first priority was to improve that parkway to make it a, a, a better road. He called it the most imp important improvement in the parkway system. Um, and that was also the year that, that, the, um, that all of the park board property up and down the river was renamed Mississippi Park, uh, which is its, still its official name. Um, of course, during most of this time, the river was a little different. This is looking across at the East River Flats, University of Minnesota, beyond. This is probably early 1900s, 1910. Um, you can see that there's not a whole lot over there. Um, that's the Lake Street Bridge. The central footing is on an island. You can see all the logs, of course. Um, the Mississippi was a logging river long before it powered uh, flower mills. And a lot of those logs got past, got over the falls. And probably one of the things that heightened the, or hastened the retreat of the falls as far as they did was so many logs going over the limestone cap that it probably broke it off. Um, that's the Lake Street Bridge as well. You can see all, all islands. This is the Meeker Island Dam. That's Lake Street Bridge there. This is the dam, the railroad, as we face this way, the railroad bridge is just behind us. Now the Meeker Dam was originally, uh, the original plan was to, to build the dams to create navigation, to enable navigation in, up to the, uh, into Minneapolis. Um, the original plan was to build two dams. Um, the Meeker Island Dam was the first one that was being built. It, was for, it had a drop of 13 and a half feet. It was completed in 1902. Um, and you can see what the river looked like below there. Look at all the logs. Um, but that is the dam and the lock, railroad bridge behind it. And the, so that city limit was right about there. Um, but after that dam was built, they decided they really wanted a dam that would provide electrical power. And that required a bigger drop than 13 and a half feet. So they could acquire, they could obtain a drop of 30 feet by building one dam, and so they blew this one up, and they built another. That's another view of the same dam. I, I love this picture just because the river looks so different. Town and Country Golf Club would be right up here, and that's looking downriver from the bridge, Lake Street Bridge. This is looking upriver from the Soldiers' Hall, the islands in the river. Um, when the park board found out that the, um, that the government was going to take the river bottom by eminent domain, they were going to take the land, uh, the park board was paid $15,000 for 26 acres of, land, of islands and land along the rivers. But that payment of $15,000 was contingent on the power not ever going, was power from the dam, dam not ever going to St. Paul, Minneapolis, or the University of Minnesota. And it didn't. Um, they, Ford came in and built a plant that took all the power. Um, but the, 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 the change in the river was significant. Um, this was the uh, Ford Dam being built in 1907. You can see the water is already backed up. This is, that was looking upriver, this is looking down. And after the dam was built, this is the Lake Street Bridge before the dam was built, and this is after. You can see how the, the footings of the bridge had to be built up to um, be surrounded by water. And that's after the dam was built before the bridge. I think it's fascinating to see the, the whole Minnehaha Park area. You can see the bridge across the Soldiers' Home is already there. 1908, the dam is there, the Ford plant is already there, but 
not much Jones. else. When would you guess that is? When? Yeah. Uh, it's probably late teens. Is that um, when they were making all the windshields for Ford out of the river then, do you think? I don't know. But they were always producing electricity there. Yeah, from the time the dam was built, um, all that power went to here. So the, um, the dam was finished in 1917 and the, the bridge was built in 1926, so it's sometime between there. Were Minneapolis and St. Paul relatively the same size cities at that time, or was Minneapolis significantly larger even then? Um, Minneapolis probably had passed St. Paul by then, but probably not by a lot. Um, because I assume at one time St. Paul, Paul, Saint Paul been a much larger city. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know when that when Minneapolis would have surpassed in population. I do know that the max population probably at this time of Minneapolis was probably getting close to what it is now. Um, you know, it peaked in the mid 50s at about 550,000. What are we now? 405 or a little over 400 or 60. Yeah. Um, This is after the bridge was built. You can see how different the river is. Um, there was another major difference that I wanted to mention about the river. Um, it became apparent, a something I hadn't really thought of until I was reading the annual reports and, and Robert, or Theodore Wirth wrote in his, um, in his 1925 annual report, he was suggesting changes for Riverside Park. And he wanted to build a stadium there with grandstands and everything alongside the river. Um, and it never happened. And afterwards, he was speculating as to why, and he said the smell was unbearable. <laughs> this was this was before there was inter, in, an inter, intercepting sewer, and so the entire sewage from everywhere flowed in right there. And instead of becoming a, a beautiful lake, which the city imagined it would become, it essentially became a cesspool. All the sewage with nowhere to go. I think the other thing that's important about this, you can see this is 50 years after Cleveland's first suggestions to preserve this riverbank. And even after that amount of time, the city hadn't gotten there yet. It, it shows how far ahead of his time he really was. After 50 years of growth, the city still hadn't quite gotten to the rivers. And there was still a lot of open land everywhere. Um, he truly did see far in advance. Um, this was a, from an editorial written in 1872 in the Minneapolis Tribune, um, commenting on some of Cleveland's first plans for the city. They wrote, while well, looking after the useful and necessary, let us not forget the beautiful. And I think that was probably Cleveland's message more than anything else. Um, I think we owe him a great deal. Would we have a park system without him? We certainly would. Um, would it be a, a special a part of the city? Probably, because some of the water would have been preserved. But would it have been what it is? Almost certainly not. Um, Horace Cleveland's vision, I think, created the system that we eventually have. Um, and I think his vision is still important because it, it suggests what we can still do. Um, as I said, the park board has always been opportunistic, and the, op the opportunity now is above the falls, and what we can do with, with land that was once uh, demanded by industry, filled with industry, dominated by mills and railroads. Um, but it's, it's open now. It's, it's available, and the, op and the park board is taking advantage of that opportunity and trying to create above the falls what we have below the falls, which is a pretty unique piece of property. I don't know of any city in the world that has anything like the River Gorge that we, we have between Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, we owe that to him. I have an awful lot more about him on my website if any of you are interested. A lot about history of parks as well as the history of um, Horace Cleveland's contributions. And I think it's always fitting to end with a pretty picture of what we have today. Yeah, I've, I've talked way too long, I'm sorry. Um, if I've held up anybody, it's a nice day outside, but I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Yeah? 
Some would suggest that the city of Minneapolis calls itself the city of lakes because the river had become, as you described it, a cesspool. So they call attention away from the river toward the lakes. Yeah, I've never heard that. <coughs> I've never heard that. Um, I think it was called City of Lakes, though, long before them, long before the, the river was uh, dammed. Um, you know, there were already articles in national magazines in the 1890s. 1890 is the first one I know of, about the Minneapolis Park System. Um, so Min the Minneapolis Park System uh, developed into a, a famous, highly respected park system really fast. Um, and a lot of that, you know, is, is attributable to Cleveland and Loring. Um, Loring Park was, there were articles written about Loring Park early on, and that was, you know, Cleveland originally designed that park, but Loring personally oversaw all the work. Uh, there wasn't a park superintendent at the time, Loring did it all himself. Um, Loring had run for mayor the year before the park board was created and lost. Um, and at the time, an editorial said that he, had, he was so far removed from his business enterprises that he had the time to commit to, um, to running the city. Um, and instead of running the city, he ran the park board and I'm sure created a bigger name for himself, a bigger place in Minneapolis history than he ever could have as a mayor. Um, interesting twist. Now, in retrospect or hindsight, were there any mistakes that people talked about that these that Cleveland or Loring made that would have had a significantly beneficial effect, but it was just something they didn't foresee? Um, most of the things they talked about eventually happened. Um, they really did accomplish most of the early goals. One of the, one of the things that had been talked about for years um, from the early 1870s and Loring was on the city council at the time, along with George Brackett. Uh, William King was another important player at the time. Um, they had talked about acquiring, there was a 40 acre a tract of land that uh, the four men acquired on their own. They bought it themselves and held it in reserve for the, the city to make it as a park. And they were willing to give up the land at what they had paid for it. Um, they were essentially parking the land <laughs> until the city, city would buy it. And the city refused. By, by one vote, the city council said no. Um, and they had even inc included in their, in their motion that every, all four of the wards in the city could pick out land for a park. Um, but it was still voted down. But th those 40 acres eventually became the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and Washburn Fair Oaks, um, which were eventually given to the city anyway. As, and, and they are parks. You know, Minneapolis Institute of Arts sits in a, in a Minneapolis park. Um, but that was only half of those 40 acres, so, so it was a little less than, than planned. Yeah? In that article sometime in the last year, there was talk, this idea of draining the Ford Dam and letting it go back to... Yeah. And in there, there was a sketch or some kind of picture, and the idea that in, in the article of the gorge being a whitewater rafting and canoe, you know, Area, I didn't see anything that looked anything other than flat water. Is it is that above 94 that it would have been the boulder field or? Um, yeah, that would have been the, the, the most rapids uh, would have been north of 90 upper river from 94 now oh. um, But there were apparently you know it was treacherous all the way down from what I from what I've learned I've never seen pictures of that's it. what I yeah, same. I've, I've never seen it. it was like look at that and I go oh, That's just inner tubing water Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I've never seen a picture of whitewater, or even boulder fields or anything. Yeah. I could imagine it below the falls. Well, and there were efforts too. They, they, there were several efforts made that had nothing to do with the park board. But in the 1860s, there were several efforts made to remove all the boulders. Oh. They were dragging boulders out of the river, oh. hoping that they could make it passable, navigable. Um, didn't work, I guess. Um, okay. But I, I wish, you know, I, I've looked at a lot of pictures I, I over imagine. the years, and I, 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 I'm always looking for something like that and hoping to find it, but yeah. I don't know if it exists. Because I, probably by the time photography was very common, most of that was gone. Or even paintings. Sometimes you've seen paintings yeah. that captured that. Well, almost all the paintings, though, are of St. Anthony Falls. Yeah. They're, they're looking at the falls, so you can't see what's behind you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's hard to tell what's just down there. Yeah. Yeah. Would, would you repeat 
Oh, yeah. Um, well, MinneapolisParkHistory.com. It's something I do on my own. Um, and I always welcome other people's contributions or comments or whatever people have to say. Yes? Was the Park Board always an independent agency? And if so, was that unusual at the time that it was created? Yeah, it was unique, as far as I know. Uh, there wasn't anything quite like it. What happened was, is that the, um, the Board of Trade at the time was an influential organization in the city. It was the equivalent of a Chamber of Commerce, but the Chamber of Commerce at that time was the, was the, the Board of Trade. <laughs> it was essentially the Green Exchange. Um, so what, what we refer to as the Board of Trade was really a Chamber of Commerce. And, and that was a group of men, Loring was, was influential in it. Um, so was his business partner, Loring, his partner in dry, his dry goods store and then his mills was Loring Fletcher. And they, that Board of Trade had significant political influence and they had tried for years to get the city to create parks and it, just, it had never happened. So the Board of Trade finally decided, let's write a piece of legislation and, um, and we can get it to the legislature. And they had a pretty good idea that, if, that the legislature would pass it because Loring's business partner, Lauren Fletcher, was Speaker of the House of Representatives. <laughs> <laughs> and when the, when the legislation was introduced, and they, they suspended the rules and passed it in one vote oh. <laughs> uh, with no objections, no, no votes against. Uh, so obviously, Lauren Fletcher had some influence. <laughs> he was eventually a congressman, by the way, from Minneapolis. Um, so if the Board of Trade, and that was an interesting piece of legislation because in the legislation they named the 12 park commissioners and they named six from each party, six from Democrats, six Republicans, um, thinking that it would help pass that way. Actually, the, the people that didn't like the measure uh, required that, that they put six of each on there thinking it would kill it, um, but it didn't. Um, and then there was some opposition initially by some organized labor groups to the creation of the parks, and the city council hated it, of course. The city council was opposed because it took away their lost control. took away their power, um, and and that's been true ever since. The park board, and the city council, have never got along, <laughs> even though at the time, um, the, the 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 chairman of the two most important city council committees and the mayor were ex officio park board commissioners, so they were they did sit on the park board, so they had considerable influence at, at that time. Um, but still, the, the city council was being, the city council said, we have far too many things to do that are of real importance instead of you know, building a drive for rich people around Lake Calhoun. Um, that was the attitude. Uh, what year was that again, the legislative delivery? 1883. Is there another, do you know, are you familiar with another city that has that separation of the park, parks from city council or downtown or city hall? Um, I don't think it exists, to my knowledge, in any major cities. Some suburbs, fairly large suburbs, I, I, I believe, have used that, that um, as a model. Yeah. Um, what, what more cities copied than our park board was the, the, the power the park board had on street trees. There, there's a lot of requests, I've seen a lot of letters in all the park board files of, from the 1880s and 90s of cities saying, you know, how did you get this authority to plant trees and, and maintain trees in your city because a lot of cities wanted to do that and didn't, didn't have the power. Thank you. Um, Which was also a suggestion of Cleveland's mm -hmm. that the street trees. Yeah, Cleveland was in favor of that. Um, and there were others, though, too. They, an awful lot of the people that supported parks came at it from a horticultural perspective. That was really Loring's approach to it as well. Um, Loring talked about how. He had landscaped his homes when he first owned property here. And he said every time he landscaped his house, someone came by and offered him more money than it was worth to sell. <laughs> and so he's, he said he made $24,000 on this, selling his first few homes in Minneapolis because he landscaped the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and George Brackett was that way. George Brackett owned the first greenhouse in the town, actually employed a gardener, um, uh, who eventually became a gardener for William Washburn and Washburn Fair Oaks. <laughs> um, they, but they were, they were all interconnected and they all knew each other. They were all from the same places. They were all from Maine. <laughs>
<laughs> all the all the influential people in the city at that time. An awful lot of them came from Maine. Any other questions? I appreciate your patience and your attention. Thank you very much.